My name is Mark Weldy. I work for Technology Integration Group. I'm calling in here on this webinar from our corporate office in San Diego, where we're headquartered and have been since 1981. And we've been partnering with Microsoft ever since then. They're one of our top tier partners and they're our hosts, they're our presenter today on this webinar for Windows 10. And we had great success. Uh, uh, Microsoft was at our annual tech fair held on our campus here in San Diego on September 19th. And we did a short in-person uh, for those local companies, but we have other companies uh, throughout uh, the United States joining us uh, today. And uh, I'll be the host and moderator uh, for this uh, 45 to 50 minutes uh, of uh, presentation and Q&A. And our presenter today, I'll hand it over to, is Albert Springhall uh, from Microsoft. Go ahead, Albert. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate it. My name is Albert Springhall. I'm with Microsoft. I'm a senior partner sales executive. And we're going to talk about Windows 10 Pro commercial today. All right. There's not going to be a test, and I'm not a college professor, but if I were a college professor and there was a test, this would definitely be on the test. So the Windows 7 and the support is January 14th, 2020. What does that mean? How many people are on Windows 7? As you can see, there's millions of people, not just in the U.S., but also in Canada. And I wanted to make sure that I highlight Canada since it was Canadian Thanksgiving this week. I'm not Canadian, but... I, uh, I would have liked to celebrate with them. Now, what does Windows 7 and the support really mean? Does that mean that Windows 7 is going away if you have an installation? No, it doesn't. You can continue to run Windows 7. You're not going to get any updates, and you're not going to get any support after January 14th. So it's really, really important that companies start thinking about changing to Windows 10 on a modern device as soon as possible. If you're looking at plan B, plan C, you really need to move on that because the data is fast approaching. And there's all kinds of things that can happen after the end of support. Since the, pro since the product is not gonna be supported anymore, there's obviously a bunch of vulnerabilities that are, that are uh, subject to it. And I'm gonna talk more about security in a little bit, but I'm gonna walk you guys a little bit about why you guys should move to Windows 10 from Windows 7 if you're on it today. You'll be hearing a lot about modern and HP will talk to you guys about modern devices and modern experiences. And it's not just about being cool and hip and trendy, right? There's real value to being modern. So before we go into what modern is, I wanna go back and say, what did old devices look like? What were they like when they were running Windows 7? Because it was a long time ago that we launched Windows 7. So if you think about what a PC used to look like before and what they look like now, there are vast differences, right? So I mean, if you see this big giant thing here, it's a big old clunker, right? Weighing at 5.2 pounds, I guess you can have multiple uses for it, right? You can do your arm workout. You can uh, get on Peloton and do your arm races because it was really, really heavy. And if I'm not mistaken, this device actually had a removable CD-ROM or a DVD burner that made it really cool, but also made it really, really heavy. And I mean, just look at that keyboard, right? Those keys are just begging to come off that keyboard. So you don't really look at this device and say, hey, I want to get some work done, right? These are old devices. Back when these things were launched, they were cool. You know, you got the thick bezel. It's just a very different looking device as what you see today with the modern devices. So Windows 7 was launched in 2009. And here's a quote from a French guy, and I can't pronounce his last name. The only Thing constant in life has changed. And anytime you put a quote up on a slide, it makes you seem like you're really well learned. I actually stole this slide because I thought it was kind of cool. But um, this guy was a uh, French essayist, and I don't know exactly what that means, but he was born in the 1600s, early 1600s uh -huh. in France. And even back then, they understood that change was happening back in the 1600s. And that's one thing that hasn't changed throughout hundreds of years, that things are going to change. Now, if you look at when Windows 7 was launched in 2009, right, and something that helps me kind of put myself back into the time machine and go back into that period when, this, when Windows 7 was launched, 
here's the music, right? Black eyed peas with boom, boom, pow, Lady Gaga with poker face, right? If you think about movies, Avatar was the highest grossing movie in 2009. And then just look at those shows, Breaking Bad, uh, The Office, right? The Office, kind of weird. It kind of came back through Netflix and a bunch of younger generations watching them. But it was actually the season finale in 2009, and Steve Carell wasn't even in it. Um, ER, if you guys remember that show, that was ending in 2009 as well. So put yourself back in those times in 2009. It was a long time ago. Other things have changed other than just the kind of movies and the music that we like and the kind of devices that we use. The workplace has really changed. If you look at the workplace and what is changing, everything from people, technology, culture, and location, it's a very different workplace than what it used to be 10 years old. Here's some really cool statistics, right? And just think about 70% of the people that are going to be working with you, for you, around you in 2025 are going to be millennials and Gen Zs. If you think about that generation and the way they embrace technology and the culture around technology, it's very, very different to the way some of us grew up. They have technology. They've grown with technology. They use it on an everyday basis. They engage with it. My seven-year-old daughter, it's funny because she'll walk up to the TV and try to touch the TV because she's trying, she thinks it's a touch screen because she's so used to having that form factor. I was watching uh, football with my son on, on, um, on Monday, and he has no idea how to be able to change and use the TV guide on the remote. And as a professional surfer, those are very simple ways. I can get multiple channels. I know exactly where to go. I got my favorites. He was going and pressing channel up and down like a true amateur that he is. But it just really speaks to the way he consumes information. At 15 years old, he's consuming information via YouTube, or he's watching Netflix, or he's going to different websites, and he's in a, in a fantasy football league. So everything that he's consuming and the way he's interacting is very, very differently. The one statistic here that's really interesting that I want to talk about is the 90%, 90% of millennials say companies' tech sophistication would impact decision to work there. That is huge, right? Think about if 70% of your workforce is going to be millennials and Gen Zers, and 90% of them will make a decision based on the technology that they're going to use. That really speaks a lot to what you need to do from an IT standpoint in giving them the tools that they can be happy, productive, and safe. And when I first saw this statistic, I kind of questioned it. You know, The first thing I thought is, are they really going to quit a job because they don't hit, get a really cool, fancy device? But then I started thinking about this a little bit more, and I talked to several people. Just imagine if you're something like a waiter, and your income depends on having an order system where you can put in orders, and they're going to be fast, they're going to be accurate. Well, your customer is going to tip you more money. What happens if you're using an old kludgy machine and ordering system is really, really complex? The customers are going to take it out on your tips, right? So you will not work there. Or just think about it in the case of a hospital and you have a nurse that spends more time putting in notes and interacting with an old machine that she needs to reboot and sit around and wait for and the keyboard is kind of clunky and it's an old machine. It takes forever to do things and they're spending more time putting stuff or troubleshooting than actually doing patient care, which is what they really want to do. Are they going to move to a different hospital that has better technology? Absolutely, especially when they have a choice. So let's talk about digital transformation and let's talk about the business all up and what people care about. So why is business and digital transformation so top of mind? Well, Going back to 2009, that conversation, there's a company that was established in 2009, and that company is Uber. If you and I had gone to Avatar to watch the premiere, and I said, hey, let's take an Uber to the movie, nobody would have known what I was talking about. So in 10 years, you're talking about a company that is now a $54 billion market cap company. They're doing $12 billion dollars. They absolutely disrupted the industry. If you're like a yellow cab company, do you think Uber has disrupted your, your, uh, your business? Absolutely. Digital transformation is key for some of these companies to be able to stay in business, to be able to do things, increase profits, become relevant. 
it is very, very important. And at the center of digital transformation are the devices that your users work on a day-to-day -day basis to produce your work product. Whatever it might be, more and more and more aspects of business are center by technology. So making sure that you're thinking about the devices and how to access the intelligent cloud, you need an intelligent edge device to help you do that. And the other thing that are changing are the worker types. So the basic job functions have changed from what they used to be like to what they are now. Uh, click one more time, please, so that slide blows up. Every single one of these industries have very different challenges but they're all centered around some common personas. And each of these personas need to have a different experience. You'll hear HP really talk about experiences and what the devices allow each of these people to be able to experience and do their job. So think about a first line worker, right? So let's just pick on this guy with a hard hat and the neon vest. If this guy is a construction worker and he is going out somewhere, what do you think he cares about? He cares about something light, that he could transport that's not very heavy, that is touch because he might have gloves on while they're working, that has really good connectivity, they're not gonna have Wi-Fi in the field or the job site. So he needs 5G, he needs something that he can be able to interact with a system. And he needs something fairly rugged and, and that it's not gonna break very easily because there's tools and all kinds of stuff around. Oh, what about a power worker? What kind of systems do they want? If you're a power worker, you want speed, you want reliability, you want the thing to be fast, you want to be able to get information quickly, you want different form factors, whether it's inking or something, to be able to transfer ideas back into the PC, back into the business, to be able to do your best work. So each one of these personas is requiring a very, very different experience. And you can only get these experiences with modern devices. So why do we care so much about modern devices, right? We have required features, recommended features, differentiators, right? So everything from a modern form factor, sleek, cool, light machine that can get work done, that has things like touch, that has inking, uh -huh. things like those hello, so biometric access, so you can log in quickly, and then having the performance of Windows 10 Pro and an Intel 8th Gen with V Pro, right? Making sure that you have that high capacity for productivity as well as a solid state drive because that consumes less power, makes the information faster. And then of course, an eight hour battery life because you wanna be able to allow your users to have all day battery life so they can go to meetings, they can go to conference rooms and be up and running or be with customers or be in different sites in different locations and allow them to work wherever they want to work without having to go and plug their battery. There's always that one person that walks into a conference room and the first thing they're looking for is a power outlet instead of shaking people's hands, right? And you know that person has an older machine. All of these modern devices and all these modern experiences by persona lead to higher customer satisfaction. And at the end of the day, that's what we're really after. We want to make sure that your users are happy, productive, and they're not bugging you, right, with all the problems. Hey, my battery's not working anymore. Hey, I'm having a problem booting it up. Hey, I'm having a problem with this. When you use a modern device, your users, your end users are gonna be happier, they're gonna be more productive, and they're gonna be safe. So let's move on to security. All right, so, so the other day I almost quit my job, right? Because I got this email from Mrs. Gary Levin and she was gonna give me eight and a half million dollars. So I just figured I was just gonna call my boss and say, hey, I'm done, eight and a half million dollars, that's enough to get me to the Bahamas and go and retire. But then I realized, oh wow, this is a fraud. I've been getting a lot of these emails. And then you can see the one below, the American Express one, that's actually better. So you're be being attacked from all kinds of places, sophisticated ones, non-sophisticated ones, nation states are now attacking. The kind of threats and the way we are being attacked from a security standpoint have changed so much from 2009. They're trying to do everything from phishing and getting information to stealing your identity. There's so many things that are threatening our productivity, that are threatening our businesses, that are threatening our personal security, that we gotta make sure that we protect our end users. 
and Windows 10 is one of the best ways to do it. So what are the things that Windows 10 give you from a security standpoint? The first one is to get the latest safeguards, right? Windows updates. That means the machine is updating quicker. You have Windows Defender that comes with it, Windows Firewall, smart screening. So much of the modern device is linked to the hardware. The next slide will really break it down by the different hardware and the different operating system and what you're protected against. Biometric access, right? Facial recognition, thumbprint recognition, huge. Instead of having to use a password that's really, really easy to hack, being able to use biometric ensures that you have greater security when they're accessing their machine. HP has some awesome technology for uh, visual hacking and marrying the operating system with the machine with IP that is unique to HP that makes their devices really, really powerful and secure. So if we take a look at the modern devices and what you basically have versus getting an older device and being able to put Windows 10. So if we start off with the black boxes, right? The black boxes are what was a security feature with Windows 7 Pro, right? It covered a lot of things, but it didn't do anything for identity protection. It didn't do anything for breach detection, investigation, response, because back in 2009, those weren't that big. Those were not that huge, huge risks. Everything's digital now. So people say, hey, I have devices that are four years, five years old. What about if I just put Windows 10 and update those systems? Am I going to be safe? And the simple answer to that is, uh, Kinda, right? You're gonna be a lot more safe than if you're just using Windows 7 old clunker like the one we saw, but look at the light blue boxes, right? You definitely get a lot more protection. There's definitely identity protection there. There's breach detection, investigation, and response, but are you fully protected? And the answer is no. Unless you have Windows 10 Pro in a modern device, you're not gonna be fully protected. Now, if you look at the dark boxes, you're basically covered from end to end with all of the modern threats. It's no longer about, hey, we found that there's a problem and we fixed the problem. We're basically being proactive about security. The new devices with Windows 10 allow for your users to be able to understand and be able to protect them, the, them from threats and from all kinds of different attacks that are coming from different places. And we all know how expensive, embarrassing, and how much work it is to be in a situation where there's been a major security threat. So bottom line, Windows 10 Pro in a modern device is the safest, most productive operating system. And it also makes sure that you're gonna be happier, that your users are gonna be happier, and you're gonna be able to do more. So um, I'll turn it over. I just wanted to thank you guys for your business and your support. And if there's any questions, I think we're going to have a Q&A later on, or you can send some emails to your account managers, and we'll be happy to answer them. But thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. This is being recorded, so if you wanted to listen to it again, uh, we kept it short, uh, and you could pass it on to your other uh, members in your organization if you like. But uh, do we have any questions? I have one question or a couple questions, just general questions um, to reinforce the point. Albert, when does Windows 10 support end? January 14th, 2020. And then uh, help us understand, will Windows 10 be replaced by Windows 11? Or what's the thought on that? Someday. That's a great question, actually. So Windows 10 is kind of the perennial operating system now, right? We're not going to have Windows 11 or Windows 12. Windows 10 goes through major revisions every so often. So the best way to stay current with Windows 10 is to have a subscription to Microsoft 365 that you guys can buy through, uh, through TIG, right? Once you have a Microsoft 365 subscription, it will get all the automatic updates. It will get all the new features. We just had a fall... Uh, release that has a bunch of features. So just think about Windows 10 is the big name for Windows. There's not going to be another Windows name. It's just going to be Windows 10, but it's going to keep on iterating. Windows 10 will always be supported. It will be updated. You'll never have a problem with security problems, right? And if you have M365, you get the latest and greatest, all the new features, all the new things that we're adding on an ongoing basis. Great answer. And then 
we, we, we talked a lot about Windows 10. Uh, if you could boil it down to just one reason on why to switch to Windows 10, what's that one word or one sentence, just to sum it up? I would say the, the, the four pillars that we focus on, right? And it's not one word, but it's four words. So productivity, security, manageability, and total cost of ownership. Excellent. And all devices can't... All devices can't run Windows 10, but uh, at TIG, we can do a Win 10 assessment for you, and we have uh, 10 available uh, at no charge for the attendees here that we can run some software brought to us by our other partner, HP, uh, that will assess and provide a report on what devices are capable of running Win, Win 10. So get with your uh, account manager uh, that registered you for this, and uh, we can um, tell you what the next steps are if, if you're interested. Uh, I've done some Q&A here. Are there any other questions uh, for the audience out there? One of them is like, will Win10 uh, Pro devices be super easy to implement and manage for those companies? How, what are the steps? Yeah, from a ma manageability standpoint, there's all kinds of tools that you're going to be able to have, right? So being able to have the flexibility of using the, uh, the, the, the tools and being able to deliver them is a very, very simple thing, right? What we want to do with Windows 10 is to make it a very simple, minimal IT involvement required. So the actual implementation is very, very simple. And then being able to manage devices is also simple. If you're using something like Intune, for example, managing devices, provisioning devices is very simple. We're moving on to autopilot. I'm not an autopilot expert, and that's basically a webinar for a different day, but autopilot would allow you with zero touch, be able to buy systems, deploy systems to your users with custom images. And that's coming pretty soon. A lot of my users are um, a little bit, I would say, hesitant of making that shift in terms of kind of the learning curve and getting used to the, the kind of changes from, from Win 7, Win 10. Um, is, what's the kind of user engagement and, and learning curve time to transition? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a really good question because everybody gets used to the operating system that they're using, right? And it's, uh, it's like an old pair of shoes. Hey, I don't want to put some new ones because they feel really, really comfortable. One of the really unique things about Windows 10 is that the start buttons, the taskbar, a lot of the things that users use quite a bit, it's the same. So the learning curve is very, very short. There's very few things that are different from a UI standpoint to making that transition harder. So if you're used to having buttons in certain places, it is very simple because they're in the same place. You have more features, you have more things that you can do, but if you turn on Windows 10 today and you've been using Windows 7, you can operate the system, you can get on it, you can install applications, you can open up your the, the apps, you can access your control panels, you can access your taskbar, all of those functions are very much the same. They're in the same place. So from a user experience, it's a very, very simple step going from Windows 7 to Windows 10. So basically, would all the Windows 7 apps be compatible with the Windows 10 apps out there? What's the percentage that we have for that? Yeah, 99% of all apps will work from Windows 7 to Windows 10, right? So if you think about commercial applications, web apps, store apps, things like that, they're all supported. Most commercial ones, so if you're thinking about something like Adobe, all those kind of applications work very well within uh, Windows 10, right? So there's no major issues there. The only applications that you might have an issue with is something that is really kludgy and homegrown, right? And what you can do is you can basically talk to your TIG reps and they're gonna do an assessment and they can take a look at those applications. Most of the applications, even the custom made ones will work on Windows 10. There's just some very, very, very minor super exception that your application will not work. In my experience, since I've been in a role, I've never run into a customer that's had an application that does not work on Windows 10. Uh, any more questions out there? Those were uh, good questions. Learning curve, apps, security, uh, the ability to get an assessment for, to see if your devices can get done. We can do that for you. 
So if there aren't any other questions, we're going once, we're going twice, three times. Uh, we will close this uh, short webinar with Albert. Albert, thanks for your time and thanks for the attendees. We had more than uh, RSVP'd, so that's always good. And this will be recorded and uh, we will push out the link to those that registered. So please uh, share with those uh, in your organization. Once again, thanks for your time. This meeting is concluded.